On today's show, we visit with sculptor Mason Young, Sweet Grace and Company, Jennifer Harris and Miriam O'Neill on Community Conversations, pop up on the local scene, hear original poetry, and talk about upcoming things to do in our area. We're glad you're here. Let's get started. Master craftsman Mason Young has known life as a geophysicist, designer and home builder, fine furniture maker, and self-taught sculptor. We went on the local scene to Mason's Manomet studio. Started out as a kid, just always messing around with knives and carving stuff, whittling basically. And I, I've always worked with my hands. And then through education, I didn't do a lot of studying of art. Uh, but I learned how to teach myself. In about the late 60s, I was working uh, as a geophysicist and it was a time of draft deferments and things like that. And that job was no longer eligible, so I became a teacher for a couple of years. And at that time, I really got interested in art and sculpture particularly because of the hands making stuff. I was building, I was in an apartment in Philadelphia, I built all my own furniture, but I felt like making something that was just to sit on or lie on or eat off of wasn't quite what I wanted to do, so I started doing sculpture. I started out doing metal sculpture because I already knew how to weld and metal was actually easier to get than wood, and uh, so I started doing assemblages of metal, some of which are scattered around the yard here. And then I, uh, in about 1970, I moved up to Plymouth and started learning how to carve wood to relieve the frustrations of teaching inner city schools. Uh, it, it, spending a half an hour beating on a block of wood was amazingly relaxing. And the results I liked, so I decided to take it up full time. I do a lot of drawing, um, which is a process that allows me to get an idea clear in my own head. I don't think of my drawings as drawings, but as a process to get an image that I then can transfer from my mind to a block of wood. So generally I'll, I'll have an idea that I've done with a drawing and then I'll look for a piece of wood that might have that idea in it and I'll start working it, the wood. Most of the wood I get is stuff that I've either gotten myself or, um, well, one good example is a, I have a walnut piece upstairs that I just recently did that came from a tree that I got a call from some friends down in uh, Stony Creek, Connecticut, and they were having a big tree, walnut tree taken out of their yard. So Ellen called me up and said, this guy is taking this tree down. Do you want some of the wood? So I, yeah, I, I'd love to have it. So I talked to the tree guy and told him more or less what I would like him to leave me. And anyway, that, and then I've got a friend here in Manomet who's uh, another guy, tree guy, and he, if he sees a nice, he's got a big block of cherry or a cherry burl or something, he'll bring it by and drop it off. The woods that I really, I love to work with butternut, which is a sort of a white walnut. And walnut I like, I do work in cherry a lot and basswood, um, mahogany when I can find a nice piece of mahogany. And at some point, generally, the wood is telling me things that are either possible or not possible compared to the idea. So there becomes this evolution of managing the, the wood direction and my own ideas direction. And, when I talked about relationships, this is the development of the relationship between me and the wood that ends up being the sculpture. So there's a lot of relationships, as I, as I said earlier, there's a lot of relationships involved. And being mindful of that is, at some point, you I will generally pause because I don't, the wood and I are not on the same level. And so that has to become resolved before I can 
continue because I can't, you can't force it. Uh, and generally, it, I mean, there's some pieces over here that have been sitting there for a long time because I either gotten involved in something else or they just never reached the point where I could figure out what should happen. Usually it's just the really simple thing about am I going the right way with the grain? Is it gonna hold the gouge properly? Uh, not so much when you're roughing something out on a bandsaw because that cut doesn't matter which way you're cutting. But if you're going the wrong way with the grain, the gouge will bite in and you'll take a big chip out. So you always gotta be aware of what how the grain is going to change and when you got to turn the piece around and go the other way. Uh, so a lot of it's just mechanical stuff at that stage. When it gets down to sanding, I will often put on some music and hopefully not drown it out. If I'm making a lot of dust, I have to run dust collection and all that stuff. But just for hand sanding, it just, you can just sit there and listen to music and use one hand to tell where you're getting and the other hand to sand. You talk about sanding is uh, takes a long time and it's tedious. You go one grit, one you keep changing grits, and then you end up having to go back because you didn't do it quite right. So it, it, it's just it's kind of boring, but it's also it's the only way to get there. And so it, in that sense, it's it's pleasurable. The next step is I usually use an oil finish, so applying that. It's not always the case, but sometimes when I'm doing the oil and the sheen starts to change things. I may have to go back and do some minor changes, but generally I'm, it's just a question. When I get to that point, I'm, I'm satisfied and it's ready to go. I think about the similarities between science and art in that nothing is fixed. You don't, you're not following rules, you're exploring, trying to make something concrete out of an amorphous body of knowledge. And the other interest that I've always had is in uh, mythology as more as a science than as a bunch of tales. And uh, so I draw a lot on some of those old themes. And for instance, the relationship between two figures is I often express with a, you know, sort of a dichotomy of form, one a soft form and one a hard form, which to me would be sort of, I mean, to use the old Greek philosophical term, Apollonian-Dionysian dichotomy, with the Dionysian being the more sensual, feeling and the other being the rigid form. Uh, and you can see it in the sculptures where there's often rectangular pieces and curved pieces. I hope that they like it almost as much as I do. Somewhere, or they just, I don't, I don't have a feeling that they ought to see exactly what I'm trying to do. But if they like it and want it, it's great. It's a really nice feeling to have somebody want something you've put so much effort into. Uh, and it seems, I mean, people, most of my sales, it's, are through people just seeing it and picking it up and touching it and, just really liking it. I'd like more people to have them. And it's not, to me, it's not a, not really a question of money, although I'd, I'd like to get, I mean, I'm not turning down money by any means, but I, I'd, I'd like them to be, have in more places. And it, it's, you know, having spent, you know, 50 plus years doing it, it'd be nice to share it some more. From knowing the, you know, each piece of wood that I have, it's kind of weird. I mean, I, I, I've got a stack of wood back there that's gonna last me much longer than I will live. And one of the things I do think about is, you know, who, who should the wood go to? Could it 
the carvings should go to somebody who loves them, but the raw wood, it'd be nice to find somebody who would treat them the same way I do. To see more of Mason Young's work, visit WMasonYoung.com. The Duxbury Free Library features a cool mixer for kids of all ages who wand to witch it up with some pre-Halloween alchemy and all in good fun Witches Brew Sensory Lab. From 11.30 a.m. to 12 p.m. on Friday the 18th, the children's room at the library will have covens of sensory exciting ingredients for kids to mix together, creating their very own potion. This magical brouhaha does require registration, so fly to the library's website to sign up. Make no bones about it, you can gain immense knowledge from walking through a cemetery if you know how to spot the clues. Founder of the Gravestone Girls, Brenda Sullivan, will be at the Adams Center in Kingston on October 10th for Past the Cemetery Gate, a 90-minute presentation that will shed light on final resting places as a valuable resource for learning about his and her stories, cultures, and genealogy. Dig into how to read a cemetery through headstone art and inscriptions, the landscape, and geology of stones. Sponsored by the Kingston Public Library, the talk will run from 6 to 8 p.m. Visit the website to register. Sweet Grace and Company is bringing the sweeter side of life to one greenside way in Redbrook, Plymouth. We went on the local scene. The idea came from the community having a need and us looking to do something for our daughter's legacy. Our daughter Grace loved ice cream, and it was something that truly made her happy. Sunflowers always reminded us of her because they're bright and sunny and they face the sun, even in darkness. That's how the logo came about. Our motto is enjoying the sweeter side of life. There were moments that were really hard and really difficult when someone you love is so sick. Grace was our daughter. She was medically fragile from birth. Grace was the happiest child you could ever meet. There's not a time you could find her that she wasn't smiling, despite having so many challenges and being so sick. In 2020, she passed away. She was on hospice for about a year. My daughter Grace was probably the most perfect soul that has ever been on the planet. She never had a bad thought in her life, never did anything but smile and just loved everybody she came across. She couldn't see, she couldn't speak, but she was able to communicate through her eyes and through her smile and through her love. And there was nobody ever like her. We try and pay homage to Grace through the store by doing fundraisers that are aimed towards children's charities. Uh, children's charities are obviously very close to our heart, um, particularly special needs children, underprivileged children, um, those kind of things. Um, our first one was for a group called Angela's House that was a group on Long Island that truly helped her amazingly through her entire life. This community also has the same kind of needs for special needs children and we just want to continue to extend that and try and help those organizations as much as we can in our small little way. One of the initiatives that we're doing is giving out keychains with a suggested donation, so it'll support the monthly charity of the month. We were originally going to be a seasonal place, but we've decided we will offer a spot here in Redbrook. They were generous and kind to offer us a really great spot in the community. So we decided to think about ways we could continue the business into the fall. So we are going to be doing ice cream sundae parties or make your own sundae with story time because I'm a teacher, so I want to keep that connection. We're going to offer ice cream pies coming up for the holidays. We also offer flights, which is four different ice creams in a container. And so we decided for football Sundays, we're going to do delivery. We have the candies also, Mother's Day, Valentine's Day, Easter, and stuff like that. We'll be able to do candy packages and the like. One of the things we're looking to do is work with our other local businesses here, possibly doing birthday parties. Um, one of Grace's favorite things was the happy birthday song. We used to sing it 
in the middle of the week, on her birthday, at Christmas, anytime, because that was her ultimate favorite song. So for us to be involved and maybe tying in with one of the restaurants and doing birthday parties, you know, let's say, you know, pizza and ice cream parties uh, would be fantastic. So we are enjoying the sweetest side of life, and our motto is to do that in this world. Enjoy the sweetest side of life, because it goes quick. In 1762, Hannah Hovey, a black woman living in servitude in Plymouth, married Britton Hammond, author of the first African-American slave narrative at Plymouth's First Church, where Hannah was listed as a member beginning in 1748. Learn about this historical couple and more of the early history of people of color from Professor Keith Green at the Pilgrim Hall Museum 2024 Speaker Series on Thursday, October 17th from 6 to 8 p.m. Through examining the lives of Hovey and Hammond and their connection to the First Church of Plymouth as a source of spiritual sustenance and community, Professor Green's lecture will underscore the larger layered narrative about the lived experience of people of color in colonial communities in Plymouth and Greater New England. Cost is only $5 for members and $10 for non-members. If you're a student with an ID, you get in free. Get tickets at Pilgrim Hall. Org. Next on Community Conversations, Jennifer Harris sits down with Plymouth Poet Laureate Miriam O'Neill. Welcome. My name is Jennifer Harris, and I am the president of America's Hometown Laureates, Inc., a nonprofit entity that promotes the cultural arts within the Plymouth local economy, as well as supports the Plymouth Poet Laureate program established in 2020. I would like to introduce Miriam O'Neill, the Plymouth Poet Laureate. We will be exploring who Miriam is during our interview. So Miriam, tell me, when did you know that you were going to be a poet? I was a very little girl, and I found poetry in elementary school. I read poetry, and then I started writing poetry. And the first poem I ever wrote was about the beach where I lived in Manomet. And I loved the music, I loved the process, and that's my history. <laughs> okay. Um, would you share with us your story about growing up in Manomet? Sure. I grew up in Manomet when there was nobody there, relatively speaking. Um, in the 50s and early 60s, Manomet was so small, the population was so small, that in the winter time, there were only 2,000 people between the Plymouth Country Club and the Sagamore Bridge. And 15 of them lived in my house. <laughs> and I lived near the beach, and the beach was my playground. I had a wonderful, uh, I was a free range child, okay. we shall say. Okay. Uh, how did your professional career influence your literary curiosity? Well, it's an interesting question because I've had two different kinds of uh, two different careers. My first career was in high tech. I was a systems and software designer for 17 years. And my literary curiosity was not exactly fostered in that environment. However, I did learn some things about process, about systems, about sequencing that have flowed into my writing life. My second career was as a, a lecturer at University of Massachusetts at Dartmouth, teaching writing and poetry, intro to poetry. And there, I would say that the reverse happened. My literary curiosity brought something to my students that they might not otherwise have encountered. And most of it was because being a free-range child, being a free-range poet, I invited them to enter poetry at their own, from their own place, rather than in a systematic academic way. Okay. Um, I, I have known you many years, and so it's always interesting to hear your perspective. I didn't realize that. Uh, thank you. Would you tell me about your experience in being published? Sure. <laughs> I, the first poem I ever published I was actually paid for, and it went to a sporting journal, of all things, and it was a poem about fly fishing. <laughs> and it was so successful to my husband in the fact that I actually got paid for it, which is unusual in poetry, 
that he asked me if I could write one every week. <laughs> but the next week, the journal didn't take it, and the next week, they didn't take it. However, I have published in over 30 different literary journals okay. in my career so far, and I have three books of poetry out. Congratulations. Thank you. It's wonderful. I, I'm sure I own them all I'm sure. with signatures. Um, so I'm sure many poets ask you for advice on how to get published. Can you give us some pointers? Well, the interesting thing is that almost nobody ever asks me how to get published. I do receive poems from people who are interested in, a, in feedback, but uh, there is a large poetry community on the South Shore and in Plymouth, and we do feed each other information as we have it. As we find it, we share it. So although I may not be the direct conduit for many people, um, I am part of that community, and that's important. So pointers? Read, read, read. I was going to say write, write, write. <laughs> well, first, I would say read, read, read. Yeah. Read the journals that you're in. Find journals that you're interested in. Find voices that you feel simpatico with. Find um, what I call literary ancestors back in time through prior generations of poetry all the way back to Homer, if you must. Find the voices that respond to your self and rely on them. Okay. All right. Um, well, you, you mentioned the word community, so I'm going to ask you to tell us a little bit about the importance of uh, the community of writers. Well, I can't stress it enough. Having turned over many rocks in my life looking for poets in the early years of my writing and feeling like I was all alone with my poems, and really writing is an isolationist experience. You go into your room or you're under your tree or wherever it is that you write, and you're alone with your words. But at some point, you need to share. And at some point, you need some sustenance from other writers. And that's what a poetry community or a writer's community will do for you. Find your people. That's all I can tell you is find your people. They're out there, but you may have to look for a while. When you find them, you'll be surprised at how much you can feed each other. And I have a poem today that I'd like to, sh that I'd like to share with you that comes from having found my community and a sharing that went back and forth. Someone sent me, gave me some poems to read. I found images and details that spoke to me and stirred up memories in me. And I ended up writing a poem as a result. That's wonderful. Would you like to read it now? I would love or recite it, which is, which is the correct to, term. I'm going to read it. Mm -hmm. To recite, I would have had to memorize. Oh, yeah, okay. And although I love the idea of memorization, I don't practice it very well. <laughs> okay. This is a poem called Lindens. A linden is a kind of tree. And uh, shout out to Elizabeth Birch for inspiring this poem. Lindens. There were linden trees in Keith, like the linden tree beside my driveway, where honey bees briz through June, ignoring every other bloom for that luscious drip. Once in Padua, the lindens almost broke me, their fragrance dense and sweet as heartbreak through the open doors. My last lover a thousand miles away and Padua's heat daring me to breathe. Are there still lindens in Kiev? Unable to flee, have they pushed deeper, searching out their siblings' tendrilled roots in the soil of parks and graveyards? Does their perfume resaturate the air each time the smoke clears? Basket bark, wood lathed into cabinets, Creamy blossoms dried and steeped to break the fever. They give and give. I read that lindens sometimes live a thousand years. Their broad limbs sprawled across the sky. Their only predator, the war makers who bomb every living thing. 
as if that means they win. Thank you, Muriel. I want to take a moment to absorb that. Um, interestingly enough, you bring up Linden's. You know that the old library, Plymouth Public Library on North Street, one of the uh, wings was called the Linden's, and they have Linden trees there. Yes. And there's a nice tie-in to poetry, the art of words, your writing community that you work so closely with. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, I'd be happy to. Poetry, the Art of Words, was the brainchild of the late Mike Amato and a few poet friends of his, including Jack Scully from Reedville, Mast, and some others. And Mike had this vision for what he called a poetry trail that would lead from Boston all the way to Plymouth. And unfortunately, Mike died young and hasn't been able to see what's happened, but in the last 20 years since the inception of this idea of poetry, the art of words, we have had a, a burgeoning poetry community here in Plymouth. We meet once a month from September to June at the, what is now the Plymouth Center for the Arts, the old library yeah. on North Street in Plymouth. And we have a wonderful community in Plymouth that has developed over the years and people are finding their way to us every month. There are more and more people coming to share poetry with Poetry, the Art of Words. Thank you. Um, you know, America's Hometown Laureates is uh, so proud to call you our Plymouth Poet Laureate. It's a, a program throughout the state and the country. Um, I believe there's about 40 towns or cities in Massachusetts that each have a poet laureate. So we're always getting new ideas from other towns and we want to be leading on the South Shore, obviously. So I know it's early days in your term. You were just um, crowned recently with laurels. Um, so could you tell us what this title means to you? Sure. It means so much to me, having had poetry be such a big part of my life since I was a little child at the beach in Manomet. And as a laureate, poet laureate in Plymouth, I feel like I have a chance to be an ambassador for poetry in Plymouth and the greater Plymouth area. And that means that I want to bring poetry to where people are rather than always insisting that people come to us. So to do that, I have a couple of ideas, projects in mind that might bring people in. One of them is a program that I participated in in Falmouth last year. It's called Postcard Poetry. And it's a chance for people to just come in and go through a short workshop and write a poem based on a postcard about the area. So it might be a post, an old postcard from the 1930s the old Plymouth Rock uh, colonnade. It's, uh, colonnade. Colonnade. Well, I'm from Cleveland, so I'm going to say it differently. <laughs> the old Plymouth Rock monument. <laughs> or it might be a picture from last year, a postcard more recently developed. But the idea is to have people write about Plymouth okay. through the po and use the postcards as they're jumping off point. The other project that I'm just starting to form, formulate in my head, so it's not on paper anywhere, is the idea of attending to all of our beautiful open spaces in Plymouth and working with the groups who conserve those spaces like Wildlands Trust and Nature Conservancy and having local writers write poems in response to those spaces. I'm thinking this is the 50th year of Wildlands Trust, okay. for instance. So it would be wonderful to have poets work with those groups to highlight our precious spaces. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you, Miriam. Um, I think that we have covered most of the subjects, and I certainly hope that the audience is in intrigued and interested in hearing more from Miriam. If you want to find out what's going on on America's Hometown Laureates, we have a website, 
hometownlaureates.com. We are posting on Facebook. We're posting on Instagram. There's, uh, is it Plymouth Poetry Forum? Is that another yes. place that people can look for more activities going on with poetry in the town of Plymouth? So thank you all. Thank you. Next, from the 2024 Plymouth Poetry Festival, is Plymouth Poet Laureate Miriam O'Neill in a reading of her original work. Yeah, there is something about reading to poets. It's really satisfying. Can you hear me now? Okay. Oh, look, I have many papers. In my mother's room, there are many papers. Is that the way the... For, no. Okay, I have um, three poems as well. Excuse me, I realize I put too many things in here, so I have to now sort them. I should have done that. <laughs> so many readings. Okay. Oh, there they are. Oh, I lost them. Okay. I'm going to read to, I'm Miriam O'Neill. I'm the Poet Laureate of Plymouth, and I'm so happy to be here reading with all these wonderful poets whose work I have come to love so much and appreciate so much. We have quite the little poetry community going here. I'm going to read three poems. Um, one, it's a prose poem. It's a, kind of long. Um, I'm still working on it, but it needs, it needs ears. It's called About That Day. What I'm not telling you about that day is about the blood. That I was 13 when she told me to carry the wet fistful of flesh the color of liver in a face cloth out of the room while she lay on the bed. A towel wadded high between her legs. That she shimmied her house dress to her knees, her knees on her beautiful long legs making a tent of the top sheet over the mess, her face blank and gray as a chalkboard that has just been erased, her hazel eyes half closed, the thin curve of her lashes, a sparse crescent of shadow on her cheeks. I'm not telling you how she felt, only that she said I should get the missile and the Lord's water, that we needed to send a soul to heaven. The neighbor my mother told me to call arrived in sandals and a skort, smelling of cigarettes and spearmint gum, one pink curler still pinned near the nape of her neck, the other curls all uncombed, shiny hollows across her pale scalp. Cherry's jubilee lipstick, a gash in her face. Hands all busyness as soon as she walked in, mouthful of cluck and tisks. She sat me in the living room on the couch, didn't notice that in one hand I still held the bloody lump in a damp cloth like a gutted fish, the little flask of Lord's water in the other. I'm not telling you that I saw there, sat there with my bundle waiting to be told what to do next or that that was the only choice I had to make that day. You might wonder where my siblings were that afternoon, how she had managed to send the bigger kids off somewhere before the cramping got too bad and got the babies down to nap, all before she called me into her room and said, I've been staining for two days, as if in 1963 a 13-year-old girl would know what that meant. How, except for me, the living room stood as empty as Jesus' tomb, sunlight pouring in and a little breeze through the open windows lifting the curtains. There's so much I can't tell you. It might have taken all day. It might have been just an hour in the afternoon. I can't tell you what day it was, except it wasn't Sunday. 
because there was never a Sunday morning when we weren't all in church. What did my father say that night, arriving home from work just as we all were sitting down to eat? What did she say to him as she moved slowly, sink, st stove to table to sink, her ravenous brood all asking for more fish sticks? I can't tell you who turned the blood-stained mattress over, who made the bed up with fresh sheets, or that for sure that night in the living room, the Lord's water didn't glow with mystery on its shelf below our framed print of Giotto's Virgin Mary clutching her chubby, too big baby Jesus. I can tell you that that night the space between two clumps of black-eyed yellow pansies in my mother's little garden was wider than it had been in the morning. That's all I really know. Uh, this is a poem um, about language and how it um, saves us and helps us understand things. It's called In Possession of Family. All that spring and summer you kept notes. This is what he said, what he did not say, what the doctor said about him, how his feet spoke beneath the sheet that last morning. In between practicing translation, you spent your ink to record his dying. In Italian, possessive nouns of place use articles, la mia casa, la mia stanza, the my house, the my room, though in English we don't say the. But in possession of family, we say, mio fratello, my brother. No article of indication, just my. The bag of his papers in your guest room closet tells fairy tales, untruths. C'era una volta, once upon a time. Forms half filled out. How often do you consume alcohol? Only on weekends. Solo ne fine settimana. And one day you wrote, his dying has sockets and keys, ways to unlock my heart if I can stand it. As if facing that door weren't hard enough. Forza means strength. O così poca forza. I have such little strength. The R rolls on the tongue. The Z stops the rolling. He liked to say, come si, come sa as if saying something bluesy or romantic, and though it was really gibberish, you knew he meant, it comes, it goes, this life, or more to the point, you lose, you lose again. Last night, so many months later, you heard his voice inside your sister's voice as she wept, the way you heard mountain snowmelt gush in the trevi as water rained on itself, a voice all water shares, submerged, subsumed, and flowing freely, his baritone inside her soprano. You've been learning to use the verbs to open and to feel, adding adjectives as you practice we. You said, Stasera apriamo tutte la finestra. Tonight, let's open all the windows. E sentiamo il bel vento. And feel the beautiful wind. And here's the last one. Um, this poem I wrote for... Apologies to those who have heard it already. I wrote for an ekphrastic event that was held over at the Duxbury Art Complex where uh, there were 50 works of art by women who belonged to the, National so the Massachusetts branch of the National Association of Women Artists. 
and 10 of those pieces were selected to have poems written in response to them, and I got to do one. And the piece that I chose was a sculpture called Inner Peace. So this is meditation on inner peace, and it begins with um, a quote from King Lear. Uh, and it's King Lear, if, you, I don't, if you're not familiar, at, toward the end of the play, they're in the prison. Uh, she thinks he has died, and she weeps over him. And then he comes to, it's sort of the Romeo and Juliet thing, then he comes to, and she has died. And he says, do you see this? Look on her. Look. Her lips. Look there. Look there. How we hold them, our brood of griefs, as if we were the nest and the small sarcophagus where love, lo lost love resides. Or are we a coracle that floats away from shore carrying our dead? How to house the pain? See here how she sleeps, how the small space between each tooth culls losses shadow, sets loose the agonic dark, seeking release. In time, the mouth once shaled with grief will open into sacred laughter, and the pursed smile announce that inner peace was always somewhere inside us. Let the third eye's lock be opened tumbled, and let what falls away keel into life's full-sailed ship, hold grace as bright as any empty Easter grave. The world does not oyster into pearl by chance. Light does not invade the dark, nor dark the light by its own choosing. If only we let each feeling find its place. This is the key. We are our own trinity, human clay glazed with joy, gilded with sorrow, balance bronzed bright by each flame. Come, understand. The way in is the way out. Thank you. This one is for all of you Dolly fans out there. If you're talking about Dolly Madison, experience the often overlooked but extremely significant First Lady brought to life at the Pembroke Public Library on Tuesday, October 8th in Quaker Girl Takes Washington Center Stage, The Influence of Dolly Madison. Janet Parnes of Historical Portrayals by Lady J will portray the wit, charm, and resourcefulness that helped this Washington high society woman unite a divided Congress, inspire new standards of decorum, introduce women into the politics of the day, and earn the respect of military and civilian communities. And while it is true that the elegant Mrs. Madison was also a snuff aficionado, Please know that no snuff will be snuffed on the premises during the show, which runs from 6.30 to 7.45 p.m. Visit the library's website to learn more. Next is a message from Plymouth, No Place for Hate. The town of Plymouth has pledged that we are a community that is inclusive, collaborative, and promotes diversity. As accountability to that pledge, Plymouth No Place for Hate Committee was established to help the town achieve those goals. No Place for Hate is a town committee made up of 13 members who are appointed by and report to the Plymouth Select Board. Our work is aimed at assuring that the Plymouth community, as well as town governmental departments and committees, are welcoming and respectful to everyone, regardless of their identity or lived experience. We carry out our mission in a number of ways. First, through educational programs that recognize and celebrate the rich diversity present in Plymouth. Second, by confronting hateful acts and bringing them to the attention of town authorities for resolution. 
while ensuring that victims are cared for and treated with respect and dignity they deserve. Third, by encouraging and facilitating difficult conversations in ways that are open and compassionate to advance mutual understanding and social harmony. And finally, we work through and foster local partnerships to advance our mission and to support like-minded groups. The No Place for Hate Committee holds open monthly meetings on the second Wednesday of every month. We welcome participation from all members of the Plymouth community, either in person or virtually. Please consider getting involved. There is lots to be done to help Plymouth live up to its nickname as America's hometown. We would love to have you join us in this important work. Project Trinity is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to connect remote communities with global employment opportunities through cost effective, globally connected work centers. Learn more at Be Inspired, a fun fundraiser at the Spire Center on Wednesday, October 9th at 6 p.m. Enjoy live music from band Despite Dwight, a silent auction, the bar, and tapas while learning about Project Trinity directly from the people who have been involved in developing their inaugural sites in Kenya and Haiti. Tickets are a $50 donation per person and can be purchased at projecttrinity.org. Whether you support a small local farm or grow some of your own food in a backyard or community garden, you'll enjoy Eating Locally, a program at the Pembroke Public Library on Wednesday, October 16th. Highlighting the ways consuming food grown close to home improves both personal and environmental health and creates a more robust local economy, this talk presented by Pembroke Farmers Market President Megan Watts also a certified integrative nutrition health coach, will provide tips, recipes, and resources to help keep you on the green road to good health and long-term sustainability. The event starts at 6 p.m. and is about an hour long. As host and producer of our popular pop-up segment, you are used to seeing our own Tiff Phillips out and about on the local scene. Today, I am pleased to welcome Tiff to a seat at the desk. Take it, Tiff. Thanks, Elizabeth. I'm super happy to be here. Every August, the community comes together for the Plymouth Waterfront Festival, a signature summer event with live entertainment, amazing food, craft vendors, and a variety of fun activities. One of the best parts of this year's festival was right next to us at Brewster Garden, where young entrepreneurs were lined up to sell their handmade items. We got the opportunity to speak with a few of these future CEOs about their products and what inspired them to start their businesses. with Jack. Jack, tell me about your business. So I sell oyster shells that we use either tissue paper or like special printer paper. And we do like town names or like sea animals, cranberries. They make really good gifts for like hanging on your Christmas tree, like hostess gifts on a wine bottle. That's exciting. What's the name of your business? So my business name is Ornaments by the Ocean. Ooh, I like that. I like that a lot. Now, I, how long have you owned this business? So I've owned it now for two years. I started in fifth grade with the fifth grade uh, entrepreneurship. And then I kept going to business sales and expanding my business, more ornaments and more, more sales. How, where do you hope to take this business? Uh, I just hope to take it like, not like locally. Maybe I'll make a web, I meant not, not nationally. So maybe I can make a website for locally. I love it. Well, it was so nice meeting you. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me on the interview. with Miss Ariana. Can you tell me a little bit about your business? Um, I make cat toys and I, because I wanted to help shelters, um, we make like a couple different products. Um, the first product is snuffle mat, so you bury their treats down in the, uh, like, the mat. Um, they have to sniff around, it's like a puzzle for them, and they like it because it's treats. I think every cat likes treats, right? <laughs> um, and then our second product is the Twinkle Ties, our original product that we found four years ago. And um, there's catnip underneath the knot when I tie, there's, I put catnip in it. And then the third product is the t tails. 
there's catnip and polyfill throughout it. They kick them, they play with them, um, and then there's also a jumbo version of that. It's basically the same thing, just a bigger, if they have a bigger cat or a kitten. And what made you want to start this business? Um, I just wanted to help shelters and cats. Uh, we used to foster cats, but we got a dog for Christmas, so we, we don't really get along. So we just wanted to help out, um, help with the cats. Oh, I love that. Well, thank you for joining us today. It was so nice meeting you. Nice to meet you. I'm with Miss Dahlia. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Can you tell me a little bit about your business? Yes. So I decoupage oysters and I take a shell and I put napkins or fabric on top of it and then we seal it with resin and then we do a gold gilding around it. It's beautiful. I actually got one. I'm so excited. I got one with the flamingo on. It's beautiful. So I got to ask you, how long have you been doing this? So I started just because of my fifth grade business fair, which was this past year in 2023. And actually the year before that, I've been working on it and working, working, working. And I am so happy to be here. And this is my third fair actually selling my oysters. Wow. What do you love about owning your own business? I love how I get to show people like my work and I work so hard on the things I do and just to see people compliment them and say like how pretty they are, it just makes me feel really good. Oh, I love that. All right, well thank you so much for joining us today. I am with Miss Charlotte from Muha and Martial Arts right here in Plymouth. You are a high orange belt, correct? All right, you're gonna teach me a move. What's the name of the move? Up Chuggy. Okay, let's do this. All right, got this? Yep. You gotta kick and point your toes and put it down in front of you. Okay. Say, and while you're kicking, you say, yeah. Okay, right. you know, while I'm yeah. kicking? Yep. All right, so let's do this. When you get up to the top, you gotta say, yeah. Okay, ready? One, two, three, yeah! yeah! Oh, I, I did too much of a... Put down. Uh, put down, all right, let's try it again. Let's try it again. Ready? Yeah. Two, one, yeah! yeah! And put it down in front of you. Oh, in front of me. Okay, one more time. <laughs> one, one, two, three. three. Kia! Yeah. Oh! Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> I am with Master Cushing and his group here, his students from Wuhan Martial Arts. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having us. Can you tell me a little bit about the school? Of course. Uh, so we specialize in uh, martial arts education. Uh, we're a 21 plus year old martial arts company, so we've been around. We have four schools, one in North Attleboro, one in Franklin, one in Taunton, and now in Plymouth here since the beginning of the year. We have about 30 students so far, ranging from white belt to high orange belt now, as you can see. And they're focused on learning discipline, self-respect, and um, self-control. Very cool. Now, what else does, uh, uh, sorry, it's Taekwondo, correct? correct. What else does Taekwondo do for you? If you're, say, an adult, what does that do for you, like mentally, emotionally? Obviously, you know, you're physically working out, but you're, you're committing yourself to a long-term goal. So you're showing up to classes, you're improving your flexibility, you're creating a family with your other Muhan brothers and sisters. Um, you know, we're very big on family-oriented, so we have parents and uh, their uh, children doing uh, classes together. Um, and obviously self-defense, you know, on, as well as competition stuff. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us today. Can you guys say thank you? Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I love it. <laughs> thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Good. It's so fun to see folks talking about discovering what Plymouth and this area have to offer through the Waterfront Festival. So what's next for the pop-up team? Spooky season is upon us, which means it's time for the annual Alden Haunted House. On October 18th and 19th, ride your broomstick over to the Alden House Historic Site for a night of mildly frightening fun. Take a haunted tour of Alden House, dare to walk the haunted maze and trail walk, enjoy a scavenger hunt and other festive activities. And the local scene street team and I will be also popping up. So come step up to the mic to chat about all things Halloween or just stop by to say hi. Costumes are encouraged, Due to the slightly spooky factor, this event is not recommended for children under the age of three. Visit Eventbrite to get your tickets. And that, my friends, wraps this episode of what's good and good to know in our area. Thank you for watching. 
And we thank our patrons, Tiny and Sons, Quintal Brothers, and Squinty's Pizza for supporting our mission of community action through media. We'll see you on the local scene. For more of what's good and good to know on the South Shore of Massachusetts, hit the subscribe button and thank you for watching.